OpenStax. Uh, well done. Who remembers to do the recording? I always forget to do the recording. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and OpenStax in the States. Uh, so Beck's been working with uh, these two people. We've got Megan from Sivula and Daniel from OpenStax. And uh, it's really interesting findings we're getting out of this. Um, I think open textbooks represent a particular flavour of OER. Um, so I think they might represent a kind of easy way in. I think people understand what open textbooks are perhaps more easily than OER in general. So I think the sort of findings we, we see here may be representative of the sort of findings we want to see with um, other forms of OER further down the future. So I think that's it for me. I think, um, Beck, are you up first to talk and then the others are going to sort of chip in as you go along. Is that correct? Sounds good to me. Yeah, that's great. Thanks so much, Martin. Um, and yeah, it's great to have everyone here with us today. Um, just to kind of kick things off, um, with a bit of an overview of what we're going to be doing. Um, I'm going to introduce my co-presenters, Daniel um, Williamson, um, who's the Managing Director at um, OpenStack, and Megan Beckett, as uh, Content Coordinator at Thea Villa in a moment. Um, Martin's going to be um, moderating the session. Um, kind of doing a bit free form um, in the sense that feel free to chip in in the chat box um, with comments and questions um, and we'll be answering them as we go. So just very quickly, um, I'm going to give a super brief kind of overview of the project and our impact map. Um, then Megan and Daniel are going to come in and tell us a bit more about Tivola and OpenStack College. Um, we're then going to move to talk a bit about the work we've been doing um, and look at the um, sample groups for the surveys that we, were ca that we carried out. Um, these are a kind of update uh, for any of you that were at Connections uh, conference in, earlier in April. Um, I did a presentation there. So these are um, an update on those findings in relation to OpenStax and also the blog post um, that came out. Um, we're then looking at some of the kind of OER behaviors, um, kind of activities that people, um, our respondents um, have been doing. Then look at impact specifically relating to OpenStax and then see a bullet. And then end with some educated perspectives where we've kind of picked two kind of areas um, where there's particular um, kind of interesting comparative kind of things to discuss. Um, we won't be covering all of the results of the surveys, but these should kind of give us a bit of a flavor of, of um, the kind of research that we've been conducting. So hopefully that sounds good to everybody. Um, so Feel free to chip in with questions. As you can see at the bottom of this slide, um, we've got a hashtag. Um, so feel free to tweet um, your thoughts as well on um, the hashtag. I'll be periodically looking at that um, as the webinar progresses. OK, so that's great. Um, OK, so first of all, here's a bit of background to the project, just super quickly, in case you um, uh, haven't necessarily browsed around on my project site. Um, we're a Hewlett funded project um, running for two years and we're based here in the UK at the European University. We're looking to kind of build a most comprehensive picture of OER impact and I'll go on and talk a bit about the impact map shortly. Um, our research is structured by 11 hypotheses, which um, we'll see in a second as well, and we work on a collaborative model um, with primarily US focus, but we also work obviously with um, people like Diabula um, who are based outside the US. Um, we have fellowship scheme, which has kind of um, built a network of researchers and been involved in connecting different people around the world. And we're also an open research project. So all of our um, research instruments are openly licensed. Um, we'll be running a school of open course shortly um, around open research. And then also we have our impact map. Just very quickly, um, here's an overview of our hypotheses. Um, the first two relating to performance and openness. So um, key to all of the uh, work that we do with our collaborators and I'll be coming back to talk more about um, some of the hypotheses that we chose specifically for the work that we're doing with Seabola and OpenStax in a minute. Um, just quickly, this is our collaboration model and here are some of the collaborators that we've been um, working with. So we started out with eight original collaborations and then through um, the work that we've been doing we've also begun to work with other organisations um, such as Seabula and BC Campus um, as well. Okay. Just a quick overview of um, our impact map. I don't know how many of you have the opportunity to check out our impact map but this is where we're visualising um, 
the data that we collect, um, which is curated evidence from which we discovered about the impact of OER, and then also the data that we've collected as part of the project. But it's more than just a kind of map. We also are kind of um, visualizing and um, charting projects, OER projects, um, policies around the world, and also um, our hashtags. So there's a lot of different stuff to check out, and you can do that by looking at the URL on the right hand side. So that kind of takes us through to um, I'm very pleased to introduce um, Megan and Daniel, um, and Megan's going to tell us a bit more at this point, um, give us an overview of the work that she's going to do. So I'll just hand over to Megan. Thanks. Hi, thanks, thanks so much for having me here and to tell a little bit about what we do. Um, yeah, so Sia Vula, we're based in, in Cape Town in South Africa, and we work in the school um, section in Cape 12. Um, and we're predominantly math and science focused. And we um, we have two sort of parts to, to Sia Vula. We um, have premium services and online practice um, tool for math and science. And then we also have um, all of our open textbooks, which um, cover grade 4 to 12 um, in, in South Africa. And our books are curriculum aligned and have been um, collaboratively authored um, in conjunction with volunteers and a wide group of community, a community of um, educators around South Africa and also all over the world. And um, What's interesting is that we have quite a unique relationship with our government in South Africa in that two years ago they contacted us and asked if they could print um, our textbooks for the whole country, which was really quite exciting for us and we um, made sure that they were curriculum aligned. And so that's what's taken place over the past two years is that the government has printed and distributed all of our textbooks um, to the whole country, to government schools that is. And um, yeah, this has really sort of um, given us a boost into um, the education sector in South Africa. And we have now recently just signed a memorandum of understanding with the government in order to um, kind of formalize this um, relationship so that any new textbooks that we produce going forward um, the government will review and endorse and make them available for national distribution. And so we focus on, on print um, textbooks, but also all of our content is available online on websites, as well as mobile, and then also on a platform, um, a chat room service called Mixit in South Africa, which has actually been um, really a great way for us to increase access to educational resources in South Africa as um, most learners across South Africa have mobile phones. And so this chat room service mixes is where we actually get um, the predominant use of our content. Um, we have over 800,000 kids reading our content every month um, through Mixit and mobile, which just also shows the importance of um, mobile delivery, especially in, in developing countries. And um, yeah, I think one of the key issues that we are trying to, to address in South Africa is that we have such a diversity of um, schools and even diversity within the schools. And many of these um, of schools are also severely under-resourced. And so um, children shouldn't be disadvantaged just because they can't afford um, textbooks. So this is raised also just trying to, to level the, the playing field. Um, I just thought someone asked what is the call, then it's Mixit, it's spelled M-X-I-T, um, and it was a, a platform developed in South Africa um, specifically to address um, low-end feature phones um, and cheap messaging. So it's, it's basically an alternative to WhatsApp for smartphones, but this um, is highly um, focused on, on feature phones, which are so very um, important in, in South Africa. Um, yeah, that's that's all for now. Thanks. That's great. Thanks so much, Megan. That's a nice, wonderful overview of what you guys are doing. Um, moving on, I'd like to welcome Daniel, who's also going to tell us um, a bit about Open Tax College and what those guys do. So, Daniel, I'll over to you. 
Perfect. Thank you so much, Beck. Um, it's really great being here, and working with Beck has been fantastic. Um, so just a quick show of hands. I don't know if you all have the hands feature in this thing. How many of you are familiar with Connections, cnx.org? Looks like quite a few of you are. Um, awesome. So <coughs> Connections was really the beginning of OpenStax College. It was the precursor to OpenStax College. Um, and so back in 1999, Rich Baranek, who um, is an electrical engineering professor at Rice University, uh, was trying to come up with the perfect textbook for his signals and systems course, which is a you know 300 level engineering course. And he said uh, to his dean, he said, you know, I want to create this this textbook. And his dean looked at him and said, you're crazy. Why are you going to write another textbook? There are already tons of textbooks out there. Why not just use one of those? And Rich said, well, none of them are perfect for my student. And so his dean said, well, why don't you figure out a new and interesting way to use the internet back in 1999 uh, to create a, the perfect textbook, the textbook that can be customized so that no one ever says, well, this isn't the perfect textbook. And so Rich set about creating something that initially he called the Secret Web Initiative. Um, and it was designed to you know, take down all the publishers, not really, but designed to, to make content and access to education much more democratized. And so over the course of the next few years, uh, Connections was birthed out of this project. And it became a very successful um, open education resource platform where people were creating tons of content, over 20,000 items of uh, modules of content that were organized into about uh, 2,000 different um, textbook-like collections. And all of this content is available as a PDF or an EPUB for mobile devices or online. Um, but one of the things that we began to look at back in 2011 was, OK, well, you know, we're, we're getting a lot of traction. There's a lot of people using this content, you know, more than a million unique web visitors every single month. Why aren't we seeing people turning to open educational resources predominantly over the traditional textbook publishers? Um, and we started thinking, well, maybe we need to figure out a way to package things so that they look like a traditional textbook publisher. They feel like a traditional textbook. And we help bring people into the, the open um, education realm. Um, when we started looking at the research from places like Babson and other places uh, that were doing research on open educational um, resources, we saw that people were having a really hard time finding the resources they needed. Uh, it was difficult to search for this stuff. The quality wasn't up to snuff, and there wasn't a lot of review. Um, that was going on to make people feel confident in their choices of open educational resources. So because of this research and because of all this information that we were receiving, we decided that we would try to create uh, a, commercial a commercially competitive open textbook that would um, compete head-to-head -head with the traditional publisher texts. Um, they matched the scope and sequence requirements. It matched the level of editorial review that a uh, traditional textbook publisher happened uh, to have. And that's how we came up with OpenStax College. So back in June of 2012, we published our first two textbooks, um, College Physics and Introduction to Sociology. And since then, we've published an additional um, three books in 2013. And then we just published an additional four in early 2014. And we have um, four more that will come out in 2014, and then an additional 10 that will be released by the end of 2016. Um, so far to date, we have over 4.2 million unique web visitors using the, the OpenStax College content that's been published, over a, million, a half a million um, downloads of the OpenStax College textbooks in PDF and EPUB format, and we've saved students, um, about 111,000 students, over $10.8 million in student savings. For us, our goal is really to improve student access to high quality learning resources. Um, right now in the US, uh, in your community college space, textbooks account for approximately 50% of the total cost to attend, attend college and to attend specific courses. And so that's a huge economic barrier. And in the US alone, um, textbooks or student debt is at $1.2 trillion. Um, and so we really 
wanted to figure out a tangible way to provide students with savings uh, immediately. Um, and one of the ways that we've identified is just replace the textbook with something that's free and open. Um, you'll notice that, you know, a lot of our focus initially has been on the free aspect of the textbooks. Um, but inherent in our mission, uh, especially spawning back all the, or spinning back all the way back to connections is the openness aspect. So all of our content is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution license. And one of the reasons that we focus on that license um, in, specifically is we think that this is foundational knowledge that should be available to anybody. And we know that no book, no textbook is perfect, even though all the textbook sales reps will tell them, tell all the teachers that their textbook is perfect. Um, no textbook is perfect. And because we make our content available under a CC BY license, anybody can go and adapt and perfect the book for their specific course. So I'll turn it back over to Beck. That's great. Thanks so much, Daniel. I'm just going to add something. Um, oh, there's a question here from Rhonda. Um, are the OpenStack supplemental CC BY? Sorry, I'll just turn it over to you a second, Daniel. That's a Am I on? Yep, I'm on. Sorry. That's a really good question. So we we specifically chose to copyright um, those resources for one reason, um, which is that we need a way to track um, teacher efficacy or teacher in teacher adoptions. So things like PowerPoints and uh, test banks and other sort of learning resources from teachers, we have applied um, a full copyright license on those so that we can maintain control over how they're distributed um, so that we can maintain contact with the teachers uh, and that way we can actually um, ping them and find out if they're using the textbook Whereas if we made those available under an open license, teach students might get access to them, and they also might be distributed by other people, um, and we, we want to try to control how that's distributed so we can have a better understanding of how the content's being, um, being used. So let me, let me clarify that just a bit. So our textbooks are all available under a CC BY license, um, and anybody can use them and access them without ever logging in. So students can have access to them without ever logging in. Teachers can have access without ever logging in. The only thing that we require that people log in to get um, are the faculty resources. One, so that we can make sure that the faculty um, are actually faculty and they're not just students trying to game the system and get all the answers to the, the questions in their book. And secondly, we copyright those supplemental resources so that we can maintain a, a control point with the faculty so that we can track the student savings uh, and also the student impact for reporting back to our foundations. Thanks, Daniel. That's really great. And thanks um, to both Megan and Daniel for those great overviews. It's wonderful to hear how few um textbooks are being used all over South Africa by millions of students. And I also hear about the great student savings um, that Daniel's been telling us about. Um, so moving onwards, um, kind of going to move and talk a bit about um, the background and the methodology um, and about the surveys themselves and then go on to look at some of the results. Um, as I kind of mentioned earlier, it's just going to be kind of a snapshot rather than working our way through everything that we did because there's quite a lot of material. Um, but we will be producing an, a series of blog posts um, in more depth, uh, with more depth about these findings. Um, shortly. Um, okay, so this slide kind of gives you a bit of an idea of um, a bit of a breakdown. So on the right hand side we've got the kind of hypotheses that we were looking at. So um, the first one's relating to student performance and satisfaction and um, use of OER are kind of the core hypotheses that were mentioned earlier. But we also kind of looked at um, whether using OER, i.e. open facts college textbooks, a few other textbooks, led educators to reflect um, on their practice or think about um, their own practice differently. And then we also looked at um, whether or not OER adoption brings financial benefits for students um, and institutions. And as you heard from Daniel, there's been great student savings, um, particularly um, with open sex um, college textbooks. So how do we go about surveying um, 
uh, these groups of educators. Um, we did run a student survey um, with Open Stack College, and I'll be blogging um, about that shortly. Um, but this, these results that follow are just focusing on educators. So we ran a number of different um, versions of the survey for OpenStax um, in the autumn of last year. So as you can see, um, we ran an initial one in the early autumn um, through the adopters email list, um, and then also um, through uh, the OpenStax newsletter, which is also when we ran the, sur uh, the survey with students. Um, that was more towards Christmas time. It closed, I think, just before Christmas. Um, and that was incentivized. Um, and we also did a number of individual, um, had a number of individual survey responses from educators that um, Daniel and colleagues had introduced us to. Um, the Sia Bullis survey um, we ran and we distributed out to the newsletter um, and email list and so on. Moving on. Um, this section is kind of giving um, an overview of the sample groups. So I'm going to ask Megan and Daniel to come in because I know um, those guys have got some comments um, to make about the respondents, um, the picture of respondents that we've got and how that kind of um, biases some of the results that will follow. So just very quickly um, to give you an idea, 77 respondents um, have used or use OpenStax College textbooks. So just to kind of clarify, um, the results that follow are people that are actually, actually using or have used the textbooks. We had quite, as you can see on the previous slide, we had quite a high number of um, respondents to both surveys, but not everybody was using um, the textbooks. Um, almost three quarters of the people that responded to the OpenStax College um, survey uh, were male, and the majority lived in the United States as well. As you can see, we've got rough, just over 10% of people um, from elsewhere around the world. Um, over 75% of respondents do face-to-face um, full-time teaching, and most of the respondents, almost 70% of them, have been teaching for more than 10 years. Um, so I don't know, Daniel, if you have any comments that you want to make at this point about the sample group. Yeah, sure. So, so I think one uh, of the striking features here is that the, the high percentage of male participants over female participants, um, I think the main reason for that is that the majority of the subjects that we're publishing into currently are um, sciences. And sciences have been pretty dominated um, by men in the past. And so that's why we see that, that high ratio of male to female um, here. And in addition to that, uh, our, our focus has really been promoting these textbooks uh, in the United States, um, and that's why probably 85% of the respondents are living in the United States. Um, they're all, of course, available anywhere in the world. Uh, anywhere you're connected to the web, you can have access to this content, uh, or I can ship you some thumb drives. Um, but really the focus of our grants um, and the, the funding agencies have directed us to direct most of our energy at um, students in the United States. That's great. Thanks, Daniel. Just to give you a flavor of um, the educator sample for Sia Buller, and I'm going to ask, there's a number of different points here where I'm going to ask Megan um, to come in and comment on. Um, we have almost 90 respondents, um, more evenly split between men and female um, when compared with the OpenStax survey. And again, the majority of respondents live in South Africa. Um, the top three provinces, and I think this is interesting, and Megan will be able to contextualize this um, more, um, live in the Western Cape and Gauteng and other regions. Um, and also, we found that almost 60% of our respondents work in a private school setting. Um, and Megan, I'm going to turn it over to you because I know there's quite a lot of background and kind of context which will help us understand the, the results that follow. And uh, yes, thanks, Nick. I think um, it's quite key to understanding um, some of the results. And uh, this came up just now when Daniel was talking about um, putting copyrights on certain of the resources so that you can actually track um, who's actually using them. And I think that's one of the um, key challenges of trying to assess the impact of open textbooks is that because they're freely available and um, anyone can download them, it is really tricky to 
to track who is using them and then to also get access to those people to see how they're using them. So most of the people that we um, actually interact with um, directly are more from um, private schools. And in South Africa, we have a, um, um, government schools and private schools. So earlier when I mentioned that our textbooks had been printed by the government, um, those are printed for the government schools, which are subsidized um, with um, government and, and tax money. Whereas private schools are separate. Um, and so they're generally um, more your higher end schools and more expensive. And um, so the reason that we interact directly with private schools is to um, school visits around our premium services, which are our online um, um, products. And, and so not all of these schools will be using our textbooks as they don't receive them for free in print form, but many do still use them um, um, online or they've um, ordered their own copies or printed their own resources. So I think it's, it's quite interesting because we sent um, the survey out um, to our email lists and newsletters and it's quite interesting that nearly 60% of the respondents were from private schools. Whereas we actually, if we look at South Africa as a whole, um, only 6% of the schools in South Africa are private. So 94% of, of schools are actually government schools. So this, um, there is quite a bias in the sample that we are actually dealing with um, the more top end private schools as opposed to um, government schools who, who would have received our, our textbooks for free. And I think that also shows why there's quite a high response, um, high percentage of people, um, nearly 20% that have a master's or, or PhD. Um, and I was asked previously if this is a, a requirement for, for teachers in South Africa, and it, it definitely isn't. Um, we have a severe lack of um, qualifications in our teachers in South Africa, and, and teacher training um, is, um, is definitely needed. So, um, yeah, and then also just in terms of the provinces in South Africa, um, Gauteng, where Johannesburg um, is um, the province uh, that it's in, and Western Cape is, is Cape Town. It's also the, the two cities that we um, predominantly visit um, schools, and there's a high concentration of schools in, in those areas. So I think that's why you're seeing um, mostly um, schools from that area. I was quite interested that we, we received 10 percent from the Eastern Cape as, as Eastern Cape is generally seen as, as much more rural in South Africa, so that's, that's quite an interesting result. And I think further on, um, it would be interesting to just look at the responses from, from um, the more under-resourced uh, rural uh, provinces. Yeah, thanks, over to you, That's awesome. Thanks, Megan. That really helps to kind of make more sense of this sample group, particularly the fact that there's 6% of schools in South Africa are private and we've got that kind of 60% of respondents working in private schools. So thanks for that, that's really interesting. Um, reading, feel free, um, if anyone has any questions, just feel free to kind of um, ask away in the chat box. Um, okay, so moving on, this is a kind of snapshot of um, we asked a number of different questions at the start of um, the survey about OER behaviours, um, and this kind of gives you an idea of the type of responses um, that people uh, have given. And I'll be asking Megan and Daniel to come in again and kind of comment. Um, as you can see, we kind of asked people a variety of questions about the ways in which they use OER. So, as you can see, over 90% of the people that responded to the open stack survey have adapted OER to fit their own needs, whereas around 55% of the Ebola respondents um, have carried out, um, have adapted OER. Um, in the same way, we can see that almost 50% of open stack respondents have created OER for studying and teaching, um, and so on. Um, I picked on the top three types of OER here. Um, as a kind of useful example as whether or not people recognize um, open textbooks as being the resource that they're using. So bearing in mind that we filtered the respondents so that we can only see people have told us that they're using open textbooks or see other textbooks. But actually, when it comes down to people identifying that they're using these for teaching and training, um, some people are, are perhaps not making the connection that what they're using is actually an open textbook. Um, 
So that's the reason why I kind of included that. Um, and then also to give you an idea of the kind of challenges that respondents are facing when they're using OER. So as you can see, for Sia Buller, um, the number one um, the, the, the response that came out top was 70, uh, just over 70% of people saying that they didn't have enough time to look for suitable resources. Um, the second uh, challenge for people, um, which is the number one challenge for open stack respondents, was finding resources of sufficiently high quality. So um, quality has comes up quite often in discussions about OER, and so it's interesting to see that kind of mirrored in, in, in these survey findings. Um, the third, uh, just over 55% of respondents um, in the CIA survey told us that knowing where to find resources um, was also a challenge for them. Um, just to kind of expand on the open steps responses, um, whilst number one was finding resources of high enough quality, um, there was also issues around um, knowing where to find resources, which was the second um, biggest challenge for respondents, followed by having enough time to look for suitable resources. So there's definitely some similarities between um, uh, what respondents from both sets of surveys were saying. So I'll just turn it over to Megan and Daniel for a comment at all at this point. Um, Megan, I'll We'll start with you if you've got any comments or things, issues you'd like to raise. Um, thank you. A couple of points. Um, just the first one that I noticed from this sort of slide, I guess, is um, the high percentage of, of teachers that are um, adapting and creating their own OER, um, especially OpenStax, 90%. But then if you look at um, the percentage that have created and then published them under an open license, it's, it's much, much less. And I think um, this speaks to our need for um, making it easier for teachers to actually um, share their resources online. And that's something that we're looking into at Tia on our um, sort of community portal to make it much more easier for teachers to share amongst themselves. Um, because they're doing this already anyway amongst the um, their local um, meetings and their local school groups. And I think in order to strengthen the OER movement, we need to tap into that and make it easier for teachers to actually um, start publishing what they're producing and, and attaching an open license to that so that we start building up this um, much more diverse and rich um, database of open license uh, resources, especially if they're um, adapting um, the open textbooks that we have to suit their own needs, so that they reshare that back um, so that someone else can um, benefit from the adaption that they've made. And then something well, I found it quite enlightening that um, the, um, the biggest challenge for um, teachers that answered our survey about Tia was not having enough time to look for, for suitable resources. Um, and this was quite a high percentage compared to all the other challenges that they, they could have chosen from. And I think um, this really speaks to a, a challenge in South Africa where teachers are, well, all teachers are really busy, but when they're looking for, for things online um, and you Google something, most of what comes up will be from, from the state, whether it's um, videos or, or, or the states or, um, or Europe. And, and those aren't um, curriculum aligned or um, even just um, more in our context where the um, learners wouldn't recognize the accents or the images will be at different places, the terminology might be different. And if we, if we want resources to, to really benefit our learners, we need them to be locally adapted. And I think that really um, is important in the creation of OER, that they really do need to be um, locally adapted adapted to the specific needs of the country. Um, and I think it's, it's quite interesting if you compare it to, say, the open facts, um, where they say finding resources of sufficiently high quality. And I'm not sure if I'm um, reading too much into it, but perhaps um, in the states that they had a wider um, range of things that they could draw on and, and, and sift through that are applicable and not finding something which is um, of sufficiently high quality. Whereas in South Africa, I think you know, we really battle to find things that are um, aligned to our curriculum and specific to, to our context, which is why we, we actually really do need to adapt OER to, to suit um, our specific um, needs in South Africa. 
Thanks. That's great, Megan. Thanks so much. Um, I'll just, I can see Clint, thanks so much for the question. We'll come back to that in a second. I'll just turn it over to Daniel in a minute and just see if he wants to come in with any thoughts. Yeah, excellent. So as Megan was talking, the first thing that popped in my mind was, who is this person who doesn't know that OpenStax College textbook is an open, open textbook? Um, that's, that's an education misfire on our part. <laughs> Um, similarly, though, when we look at this 90.9% um, adaptation number, um, and then we look at that 14.3% uh, published it under an open license number, I think the thing that I would want to dig further down on here is to understand how people equate open, open licenses to open content. Um, one of the things that we've done uh, a little bit differently um, is when we talk to people about the content, we focus a lot on the flexibility aspect rather than the licensing aspect. Um, and that's probably why this number for publishing under an open license is so low, is because people don't know enough about what an open license is. And that's, that's probably a failing on our part, and that's why this research is really great because we can start to expand upon that when we're talking with individuals saying, you know, this open license allows you to do all these things, and when you publish on Connections, uh, this gives you the opportunity to make this content more widely available and more widely disseminated for others to use as well. Whereas if you lock it up under a copyright license, uh, you're not going to give people the same sort of capabilities that you were afforded uh, because we've chosen to use a Creative Commons attribution license. Um, Clint asked the question about, do we know how people are adapting? Um, to be completely honest, we know a subset of how people are adapting the content. Um, we know that there's over 100 adapted versions in connections of the, the different books. Um, but I can promise you that the people who responded to this textbook uh, or not this textbook, this, this survey, um, were not all, all those 100. Uh, so there's probably people who are adapting it outside of um, the Connections platform, in which case we, do, we really don't have um, a lot of good data on how they're doing that. Um, that's, a, that's definitely something we want to look into further down, down the road. That's awesome. Thanks, Daniel. Um, yeah, and I think that's just to come back on a couple of things. Um, back to, uh, well, I'm just reading in the comments box at the moment. Um, just to come back on your comment, Clint, um, we did ask, and there's further work and analysis to be done, we did ask a more general question about how um, people have used or currently use open stack textbooks. So when we kind of delve a bit deeper, um, we might be able to glean a bit more about what kind of adaptations people were making. So um, hopefully watch the space um, and we'll have a bit more um, data on that shortly. Um, a bit more analysis rather. Um, the other thing is just to come back to the open licensing um, question. Um, one thing that we asked in uh, the Theo Willow survey, which we didn't unfortunately in the open stack survey, was um, about identification of Creative Commons licensing. So um, we showed people a picture of the CC license um, um, gave them a definition and kind of asked people whether they recognized um, the logo. And in the Sea of Willow survey, um, almost 40% of people uh, said that they'd never seen the Creative Commons um, logo before, um, whereas almost 45% of respondents said they, they'd seen it and they knew what it meant. Um, meanwhile, we had 70%, just over 70% of um, respondents telling us that open licensing was very important or important to them when using resources in their teaching. So <clears throat> there's definitely the connection between open licensing and um, open content and the flexibility it gives you. It's a really interesting question, and it'd be great to kind of um, uh, look more at those questions. Um, OK, that's great. Thanks for that as well, Martin, regarding the open steps figures. That's awesome. Thanks. Yeah, I'll just come in and those. Um, so this was uh, Daniel very kindly sent me a link to all their um, uh, resources. So at the time when I did it, this was a few months ago, they had 1,245 resources, and then they also list 
adapted resources. So there were 419 that had been modified. But a lot of those were the same thing that had been adapted by different people. So um, it's not quite a straight sort of percentage. But so some are more popular for adaptation than others. But I think it's a pretty good return. You know, it's like. Um, and that speaks sort of slightly higher than the 14 percent you've got there. So I you know, sometimes it might be the same person adapts them lots of times, of course. But um, so I, th I think that's a pretty good kind of return of people beginning to get the hang of uh, adapting stuff and, and then sharing it back with, uh, with the OpenStax people. Awesome. Thanks, Martin. That's great. Just looked at the time actually. We were kind of running short on time. Um, moving on, what the next couple of sections are kind of looking at some of the kind of qualitative um, uh, findings that we have regarding um, different types of impact. So we're going to kind of first of all look at OpenStax College textbooks and move on to look at Sia Villa. Um, we asked people a few um, open textbook questions in the survey. Um, the first was related to the hypotheses that was indicated earlier, um, which is the impact of using OpenStax textbooks on um, people's own teaching practice. So there's a kind of range, obviously, these are selective uh, quotes from um, respondents, but these give you a flavor of, of what people are kind of telling us. So there's a number of people are kind of saying um, and reflecting on the, the, um, that they're able to kind of be more creative with the way in which they teach. So there's a couple of people here, you can see some quotes on the right where people kind of talk about how they um, are creating images themselves, they can design and they're able to make use of other resources to kind of build something that um, works better for their students. Um, and as the person on the right hand side kind of says, what OpenStax enables them to be be in their teaching is more flexible in a way. They don't have to feel constrained um, to use a textbook that students pay $250 for. Um, there's more flexibility with, it, with things that they can use. Um, someone else kind of talks about being more intentional um, because, again, they've got increased flexibility um, through using something like OpenStax textbooks. We also kind of ask educators to reflect on what ways um, using OpenStax College has impacted on their students. Um, I've got a couple of slides with some um, uh, quotes from educators here. So this is educator perceptions of um, benefits to students. Um, there's a couple of things I kind of want to bring out here um, in these quotes. One of them is that um, it really does kind of appear in the case that openness rather than it being digital is making a difference. So there's a couple of quotes here where somebody's saying that unlike other, there's a quote on the right, unlike other e-textbooks, this one can stay with them. And somebody's saying that while well, people can kind of um, keep the resource with them after leaving class, whereas for others, and you can see in the top quote, people don't have to wait. Um, to start using the textbook. So there's this idea, it's not just about it being an e-resource that you can access for a set period online. You don't actually start engaging with, with um, your studies much earlier and then retain the textbook and kind of refer to it later on in your, in your studies um, after you've kind of finished the course. And there's a similar kind of quote coming up in the Seawilla um, survey results as well. Um, also, just to kind of note, um, some of the kind of comments here about sharing, and then also some people kind of refer to people um, excelling in their exams. There's a similar comment here on the next slide where somebody talks about um, enrollment in their class increasing by 25%. Other people kind of reflect on engagement and the fact that something like OpenStax means people don't have an excuse to, um, <laughs> to not send their homework. So, there's all these kind of reflections from, from educators, um, as well as more of the financial, institutional financial kind of uh, uh, issues that are highlighted by the statement in the bottom left, where somebody's saying, well, you know, budgetary constraints means that I would have had to have purchased kind of out of date tech. So at this point, Samuel, I don't know if you had any comments that you kind of wanted to make at this point before we go on and talk about the Sia Villa results. 
No, I don't, I don't really have any comments. I just think it's really exciting um, that students on the previous slide were saying that they're able to, you know, start sharing. Uh, because, you know, with the way the traditional copyright um, limits and digital rights management limits uh, sharing of content, Open educational resources encourage individuals, especially students, to share these in informal learning environments. And I think that's a really interesting byproduct of the open license. Great. Thanks, Dan. That's awesome. Moving on, just to kind of look at the responses we had from a few Bula respondents to these questions. Um, these are a few Bula educators. Um, reflecting on the impact of using this, these open textbooks um, on their own teaching practice. So again, we have somebody commenting on the left-hand side, kind of similarly maybe to the um, open stack educator um, in the previous slide, that you know, people don't have to hand back the books. They can kind of keep them with them. Um, other people kind of reflect on the fact that, you know, OK, this has been a great experience for me. Um, this is the person on the top right-hand um, side. But many teachers maybe aren't kind of thinking along the same lines as them. So there's a kind of challenge for, for that person and they're there, the, the colleagues that they kind of work with. So hopefully this gives you a flavor of some of the um, responses that we have to this question. We asked a similar question um, about impact on students. So uh, here we had um, a range of different responses. Um, Improved computer skills and learner's bags were a bit lighter, says the person on the left. This was also something that was highlighted um, in the OpenStax research that we've done. Um, people did kind of make similar comments about, well, people don't have to carry around as many textbooks, for example. Um, you know, there are benefits kind of in terms of uh, people's computer skills um, becoming better through using online resources. Um, some of the people here are kind of commenting on the fact that Sia Buller has given them the opportunity to integrate different resources um, and therefore widen their exposure to them, so on the right-hand side, or to kind of help them hear uh, a different perspective um, on issues. I'll just hand over to Megan a minute and catch up on the um, chat box a second. Thanks, Megan. Um. Yeah, I think um, just going back to the, the teaching practice, um, some of the comments that, that came out were, were quite interesting because people noticed that they'd been collaboratively authored in this whole idea of collaboration. Um, and because in our in our in front of our textbooks, we list all the authors, um, all the volunteers that have been involved. And I've been surprised at how many people have actually picked up on that. Even learners that comment on our Facebook page, they, they really like the idea that um, there was such a vast group of people that came together to contribute and put this book together and that they were volunteers. And I think it makes people also reflect on their, their own practices. Um, and we've also seen that it's, it's been a sort of an indicator of quality because people, especially educators, find it um, very consoling that so many people contributed to this book um, and from multiple different um, sectors, um, professors all around the world. And then, yeah, I think having access to the textbooks across the grades has also been um, really influential to students because, or, or learners, because especially at school level where a subject progresses so strongly from one grade to the next, and if you had a, um, a traditional textbook, you'd have to either give that back at the end of the year and you wouldn't have access to it. So you don't have any access to your previous um, resources for revision. And, um, yeah, I think our books are really learner-centric, and that also came out in some of the comments that um, because we're trying to cater for such a diverse need of, of learners in South Africa, we very much pitched our, our content um, to be able to be used by, by learners by themselves, even if they don't have um, a teacher or a qualified teacher in the classroom. And I think that really came through in the comments as well, which is, which is really great to see. Megan, that's great. Um, I'm just catching up in the chat. Um, to come back, I wonder, like Megan was saying, whether um, it's a question of um, access rather than ownership. So, as Megan was kind of saying, like you don't have to sell um, books necessarily into the back, or you know, I wonder if that kind of um, is, is more the 
issue than actually owning owning something per se. Um, just to move on, um, the next couple of slides you wanted to kind of look at um, some educated perspectives and kind of bring out some kind of areas where I'm, I'm conscious of time. So there's a couple of slides that we're, we're going to kind of talk around for a bit now. Um, what we're going to do is look at some of the statements um, and compare Theobola and Open Steps College and Megan Daniel will kind of come in and, 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 and give a bit more insight. Um, the first one relates to use of OER in the classroom. So we ask educators um, to say how much they agreed with a series of statements. Now, as we've kind of been saying, and as has hopefully come out in some of the, the, the kind of quotes from educators that have appeared on the previous slide, people are kind of referring to the flexibility um, that OpenSex and Theobola give them. So they, and unsurprisingly, maybe, um, the top response in both of these surveys um, to this question, um, to the statement uh, use of OER in the classroom, um, was that it allows people to better accommodate diverse learners' needs. And it kind of makes sense because with the flexibility of OER, with your, you know, you're not feeling constrained to use particular resources. Um, you can kind of remix and modify them. Um, this came out as the number one response. Um, these were followed by, um, as you can see, developing learners' increased independence um, and building learner confidence in the Sea of Wallace survey and increasing learners' experimentation um, and satisfaction with the learning experience for the OpenStax College um, survey results. Um, just, I'll just turn it over to Daniel and Megan a moment um, for their reflections uh, a second while I look for some additional survey responses just to give it a bit more context. Just one moment. Yeah, this is this is great. I think this is um, focuses a lot on improvements in academic freedom. So you're not locked into that one size fits all textbook and allows you to really accommodate the diverse learners' needs by customization and adaptation and make it, you know, perfect for your specific course and your specific students. So I think this is resonates quite well with what we hoped for and expected, and it's nice to see uh, that the respondents also agreed. Thanks, Daniel, that's great. And just to kind of come back in before I open this to Megan um, for her reflections, um, we had overall the few of respondents um, tended to answer quite frequently uh, strongly agree or agree with a lot of statements. As you can see, we've got the top response is 85% of people. Um, in terms of looking at um, how that stacks up against what um, the open stack second and third um, responses are, um, building learner confidence came out at, I'm oh, sorry, that's the one up there. So for open stack, building learners confidence came out at about just over 45% of respondents strongly agreed or agreed um, with that statement. Um, whereas 58.1% of um, respondents told us that they, uh, from open stats, told us that they um, thought they strongly agreed or agreed that um, it developed learners' increased independence and self-reliance. Thanks for that comment, Martin. That's really useful. Um, yeah, I agree. Um, Megha, did you have anything that you wanted to add at this point at all? Um, yeah, well, just to, you know, I completely agree with, with, um, what Daniel said about just accommodating diverse learners' needs. And I think it also, well, I was also speaking a bit about it earlier that we have such a, um, range of, of schools, um, in South Africa and also such a range of learners within a school. Um, and so really being able to cater to, a, um, the diversity of those, um, learners' needs is, is crucial. And it's really fine to see um, that that people are, are recognizing that within the textbooks. And then secondly, I think um, also the fact that the textbooks are available in, in multiple different formats um, allows for learners to also use them outside of school, um, which is perhaps why we're getting we're seeing the 
increasing the, the independence and self-reliance and also the, the confidence because they, um, they're they able to, to access the, the content on their phones, they can they can read it on the bus on the way to school. Um, and we've we've had a few quotes from some learners where they actually referred to our, um, our content as the textbooks in their pockets. Um, and I think that that really speaks to um, yeah, making your, your content um, not only openly available, but available in, in multiple different formats to, to suit um, different needs and um, allowing learners to, to access the content whenever, wherever they, they are and on the move. So, yeah. Thanks, Megan. That's great. Um, wonderful. And I think it's also really to, really interesting to kind of think about the question of who do we mean by diverse, or who are the respondents thinking of when they're thinking about diverse learners and what that means. Um, so that's awesome. I'm conscious of time. Um, I'm gonna, we've got a couple more slides and a bit more discussion to kind of go um, on the presentation. As you're aware, it is being recorded and will be available afterwards. Um, uh, but yeah, we'll kind of keep going and there'll be a bit of time for questions at the end if everyone's happy with that, so thanks. Um, okay, so another kind of um, area where we found some kind of interesting uh, responses um, and similar responses was we asked um, people as a result of using um, either Steelbull or OpenStax, were they more or less likely to do um, certain kind of activities? So one of the... Um, there's three kind of um, options shown here. We did ask people about other kind of things, about whether they'd um, make the textbooks compulsory, for example. Um, it's interesting to kind of note that um, a large number of educators would recommend um, the textbooks to fellow educators and, and teachers, which is a great endorsement of um, both OpenStax and Sia Villa. Um, there's also a high number of people who would recommend see one of the textbooks for students as an additional study aid. Um, and the same applies for OpenStax. Now there's kind of it appears thinking about the way in which see um, uh textbooks have been distributed um, across South Africa. Also our respondent base is largely kind of um, private schools. Um, educator respondents, um, where I think that we got the impression or it seems from some of the comments that were in that were occurring elsewhere in survey um, results that people were using Seabola maybe as optional um, textbooks. So I think Megan's probably going to come back in and say a few words about that in a moment. Um, and then also um, something that was wonderful to kind of see, um, our last kind of um, set of results at the bottom, which kind of where we asked people whether they were more or less likely to use other OER for teaching as a result of using um, both OpenStax and Seabola textbooks. And as you can see, we've got quite an amazing response, which is that nearly 80% of people um, using OpenStax would be more likely to use other OER, and just over 90% of Seabola respondents said the same thing. And I think that's a really great endorsement of the fact that using something um, like OpenStax and Seabrilla means that people are more likely, despite coming from, particularly in the sense in, in the case of the OpenStax respondents, where we asked people who were already adopters of the textbooks, um, uh, well, you know, a proportion of our respondents come from people who are already using um, and have adopted the textbooks within their own institution, who are involved in kind of um, uh, remixing and, and using probably other forms of OER, um, that still people are more likely to use other OER as a result of that. So I'll just turn it over to Megan and Dan for their comments in a moment. Thanks. Um, yeah, as, as Dick pointed out, um, most of our, our respondents were from, from private schools, and I think a lot of those schools are still using um, the traditional textbooks that they have been for a while. So, but they aren't averse to pointing out that they can actually use our textbooks as an additional um, optional study guide or an additional textbook. Um, and I think it's also it's interesting because we, we're breaking into that market of competing with um, publishing houses within South Africa. And um, more and more private schools are starting to, to use our textbooks. Um, obviously, the government schools um, have got them for free. And I think um, these results, both for um, the textbooks and OpenStax, um, the fact that 
they're more likely to recommend the textbooks to, to others and also their students. Um, such a high percentage also speaks to the, the quality of the textbooks and um, and shows that these textbooks are, are actually a, a really um, quality um, product that can compete with, with other publishing houses textbooks that are out there, um, both in, in South Africa and the States and around the world. Yeah, I, I echo exactly what you just said. Um, I think the reason why we're seeing such high uh, recommendation rates um, for both series of textbooks is that there's been a lot of, of time and energy and resources uh, concentrated on making sure that these are the highest quality resources. You know, panels of peer review, um, teams of writers and editors and researchers making sure that all the quality, all the content is in there and that it's high quality and matches up with the standard scope and sequence requirements of typical college courses. Um, the, the, we've kind of espoused an idea that you know, originally OER was made for individuals um, to use with their course and then disseminated uh, so others could take and adapt that content. Um, and the way that we kind of transitioned away from just having an individual sitting in a room creating content for their, themselves to something that's a little bit more broadly focused with OpenStax is really focused on providing that turnkey course solution um, that meets, you know, pretty much 90% of um, at least 90% of a, a faculty members' needs with the course. So then they're not having to go and hunt for stuff. Um, they have a turnkey solution. And I know that's what Tiavula has really been doing as well, focusing on building content that's aligned to the, the national curriculum. Um, so, I, I mean, I think that this is really excellent. I'm really excited about this, this percentage of educators that are saying that they are um, willing to recommend this to other faculty members. And we're actually beginning to see this um, in the growth of adoptions that we're getting. Um, typically, the way higher education works um, is that there's either a committee adoption of a textbook or there's individual faculty choice. Um, in our first year out, we saw a lot of the individual faculty choice where individual faculty members were choosing to either pilot the textbook or they were choosing, they, were, they didn't have to go through a committee adoption. And this year, what we're seeing is a lot more of the big committee adoptions, um, and that means increased number of students who are using these books. And that's coming primarily because we have these people that we like to call textbook heroes who are going out and, and, and being our sales force. They're going and promoting this content to their colleagues and their, their um, peers and saying, this is something you really need to look at, and it's an opportunity to help save your students um, some money and lower the financial barriers. That's great. Thanks, Daniel and Megan. Just a final roundup before there's a couple of questions um, in the chat box. Um, just to quickly sum up, um, I'll be asking Daniel and Megan in a moment for any further comments and kind of to sum up and their thoughts and so on. Um, in terms of next steps, we're kind of obviously, as I said at the start, um, there's quite a lot of data um, from this survey, so we'll be releasing this. Um, through um, our impact map um, and then also a series of blog posts um, which are forthcoming. Um, we're going to be doing further work around comparing adopters and users with non-users um, and then again pub looking at public school and private school respondents in the Ciavula, um survey. Um, as I mentioned also we've begun work with, um, and it's great to see Amanda and Clint here, um, on the BC campus um, and we'll be looking to because we, part of the way in which the research that we do is set up so we can make comparisons um, across different um, uh, groups of um, respondents. So we'll be able to make comparisons between, say, um, what, as you can see in, in the presentation, between, um, for example, open textbooks users in South Africa with those in Canada and with people who are using OpenStax and so on. So that's really exciting. Um, Further so work involves producing case studies, um, looking at comparative impact data and structure interviews, um, and so on. And the last point is a kind of open invitation to add your own evidence to the impact map as well. So I'm just going to turn it over to um, Daniel and Megan for any comments they want to make. Um, and then, actually, maybe we'll do the questions first, actually. I'll just go back and look here a moment. Um, 
okay, Megan's responded um, to the question from Sukena about updating textbooks. That's great. Um, so I don't know if anyone else had any questions that they wanted to ask before I pass back over to Megan and Daniel. Um, we'll just give it a minute in the chat box. Or Martin, if you wanted to come back in and at this point. Uh, no, I think that's good. I don't know if you guys want to wrap up. But um, uh, thanks, Beck. I think it's, just, it's interesting that I think the work we're seeing with the open textbooks now, uh, and uh, as you've seen me, the thing I keep banging on about is what's the, what's the difference that openness makes? And I think free is great. I mean, let's not underestimate free, you know. But um, if you say to someone, do you want this $100 textbook or this $0 textbook, you know, both of good quality, and they're probably going to take the $0 one. So, I mean, a lot of those findings aren't surprising from that point of view. So I think it's, it's really interesting to see the the bits we're seeing that come through where the openness is the, is the kind of key element that allows other things to happen. I think, you know, I think free is a good hook. It's an excellent hook, you know, but, um, but it's then I think once once you've got them in, if you like, with the, with the free hook, and they uh, they start to explore the, the issues of openness, and that was interesting to see some of that in, the, in those those responses. I didn't know if um, we were turning it over to us to talk, but um, one of the things I just typed in the chat was that I actually think that at some point free can be a deterrent and people don't like the idea of free because free equals poor quality in a lot of people's minds. Uh, and I think what's the real hook for um, the content that's been produced both by OpenStax College and by Siavula is the focus on quality. Uh, a free bad book is still a bad book. Um, a free high quality textbook that m matches up one to one with uh, an, a traditional publisher's textbook means uh, it, it should be high quality and compete with those textbooks from the publishers. Um, and I think that that's, that's a good book. That's the hook is the quality, not necessarily being free. Thanks, Daniel. That's awesome. Sorry, I didn't mean to spring that on you. It was <laughs> just if you had anything that you wanted to kind of add. Um, I don't know, Megan, if you've got anything you want to add before we kind of say thank you to everyone for attending. Um, no, I think um, just the next step will, will be just to delve a bit deeper into, into some of the results as they said, um, especially looking looking also at respondents who don't use the textbooks and some of, some of those um, those reasons. And um, yeah, I think one of the, the biggest things that um, well, I've started to take away from this is that we've seen evidence that teachers who are engaging with um, content that is open makes them want to reflect on um, on their own practices, and especially recognizing that these um, books are um, community driven. They're collaboratively authored. Um, people have shared their own ideas, so it's trying to and get them used to the idea of, of the benefits of, of open um, in a more subtle way. And I think I think that's um, that's great to see. And um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Megan. That's awesome. And thanks also um, to Daniel. It's been really great having you here um, today and to talk with me and um, Martin about the research we've been doing. Um, I'd also like to thank everybody for hanging on. I know it's quarter past um, the hour already, so thank you so much. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Daniel. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And um, yeah, if you have got any other questions or anything that you want to shout out, if you think something after the webinar is kind of closed, then um, feel free to sh um, shoot it to us on Twitter or, or similar, or drop me a line. Um, we have a string of um, uh, blog posts coming up um, with some of the uh, more developed discussion around some of the findings. But hopefully, today's given you a flavour of some of what we've been doing. And um, yeah, thanks, Clint. That's great. And I'm looking forward to working with you guys at BC campus as well. So thank you to everyone who's attended today. And it's been really great having you here. Um, so thank you so much. I think it's just a little round of applause for showing our hands for the three speakers. Thank you very much.
Cheers, Ben, and uh, Megan and Daniel. That's really great. Thanks. We'll, we'll record this and we'll put it up on uh, the OER Research Hub website. So uh, um, we can do that then. And that should be up. I don't, it might take a few days for it to appear, but we'll put it up there then. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day, evening, whatever your time zone you're in. Thanks. Bye.